Wait, what? Hands down, racing makes for the best stories. And I wanna share with you one of my favorites. This may look like your standard Chevrolet small block, but really what you're looking at is the world's best disguised 660 horsepower V6. Now the trick is, if you want to make maximum horsepower, you've got to do a lot more than simply unplug the back two plug wires. Now Keith was willing to show us everything he's done, and I think it's fascinating to watch the way he thinks when he builds these motors to break records and set himself apart from the pack. Honestly, there's really very little reason to go to the trouble of building a high winding V6 using a NASCAR SB2 as a foundation, unless you're talking about finding an advantage in a racing rule book. And that's exactly what engine builder Keith Dorton of Automotive Specialists has going on here. After a long career building winning stock car racing engines, including the Daytona 500, Dorton has become a major player in land speed racing where a thin rule book allows for more creativity. The Hot Rod Hoodlums race team plans to use this engine to break the current Bonneville speed record of 228.7 miles per hour in the gas rear engine roadster class with an engine displacement of less than 261 cubic inches. The problem with building a naturally aspirated V8 that small is you still need lots of bore in order to fit big valves for plenty of airflow, but that in turn leaves the stroke so short it's hard to develop any compression. And if that's a little confusing, I'll just let Dorton explain it himself. So, so the question is, why would anybody take a V8 and build a V6 out of it? Well, this is going to the bottom for land speed racing, and they have different classes based on cubic inch. This particular class is limited to 261 cubic inches to actually 260.99. And if you do that on a V8, you're so many, you're so few of cubic inches per cylinder, it's hard to get any compression. Now we've done that and had success with it, but the most compression we could get is about 11, not even quite 11 to one. So it hit me, why not just do a V6? And uh, that way we'd have another, what, 12 cubic inches or so per cylinder. And we could maintain a 13 to one compression. So we did, and the simplest way that I found to do it which just eliminate <clears throat> two cylinders on a V8 block. Uh, experiences we'd had with 90 degree V6s in the past where they were prone to a lot of vibration and we didn't want that for an endurance type run like we'd be doing out there. So we uh, just eliminated the back cylinders, back two cylinders. <clears throat> we come up with uh, right at 259 or so cubic inches and about a 13 to one compression ratio. Now. To simulate the V8, we fabricated a weight to go on the crank pin. Bolts on just like the connecting rods would. And we've already run this engine, so this is a rebuild, and it was just as smooth running as any V8 you've ever saw. Now, and it has a unique sound also. It's kind of a cross between a, a V8, a V6, and a Harley Davidson. By the time I got involved with this engine build, Keith had already nearly finished the short block, but I think I can catch you up to speed. The basis for this build is an SB2 race engine formerly built by Hendrick Motorsports and raced in NASCAR's Cup Series. And no, I don't know what car or track. Dorton likes the SB2 architecture for land speed racing because it breathes so well and develops tons of power in the upper RPM ranges. The crankshaft is a billet piece from Bryant with three and a quarter inches of stroke. Attached to that are six Carrillo connecting rods that are six inches, 350 thousandths long, and a half dozen custom Molly pistons finish the rotating assembly. In the lifter valley, Dorton has pressed in these machined aluminum slugs to seal off the oil galleries that feed the lifter bores for the back two cylinders. This will help maintain proper oil pressure throughout the rest of the engine and also seal the lifter valley for scavenging by the multi-stage dry sump oil pump. Here's another look at those Molly pistons. This is a rebuild, so the pistons aren't new. At TDC, the pistons are flushed with the deck of the block to maximize compression, and to that same end, the valve pockets are absolutely as small as possible. 
Meanwhile, the cam is a big boy in every sense of the word. Ground by crane cams from a chunk of billet steel specifically for this build, the camshaft is 55 millimeters in diameter to resist twisting because even the slightest twist can screw up valve timing events. It's a solid roller and has also been gun drilled to lighten it up a bit. Being a race cam and a grind he's worked hard to develop, Dorton prefers to keep much of the specifics on this cam to himself. However, since this engine is designed to work at 9,000 RPM and above, we do know the duration is huge. Over 270 degrees at 50,000 lift for both the intake and the exhaust valves. Once it's in place, a racing belt drive system is used to control the timing because it's more resistant to stretch than a timing chain. Since there's been machine work decking both the block and the cylinder heads, Dorton checks piston to valve clearance before final assembly. It turns out at its tightest, the intake valve has 72 thousandths of clearance and the exhaust has 170 thousandths. That's including the 40 thousandths thick head gasket. Now that's pretty tight for the intake, but it's doable. Also, check out the radial clearance in the valve pockets. That is right up against the pocket wall. Of course, the intake valve should be a few thousandths higher in the pocket and the wall leans back quite a bit, so the clearance is actually more than the machinist die would suggest. There are no rods or pistons in the rearmost cylinders. Those are numbers seven and eight. After all, including the pistons would only add friction inside the engine. So Dorton designed and machined this weight that clamps over the crank's rod throw. It simulates the weight of the two connecting rods and pistons. And exactly how he came up with the exact mass to keep the engine balanced, he's keeping that to himself. The cylinder head is a high-flowing SB2 model that's already been ported by Hendrick Motorsports. Notice the plate over the combustion chamber at the rear. That's simply an aluminum cover that's been bolted in place and machined flat with the rest of the head. The combustion chamber and ports have also been plugged with epoxy. For the functioning three chambers in each head, however, the intake valves are a 2 inch 180 thousandths diameter with a 6 millimeter stem while the exhausts are an inch 580 with a thicker 7 millimeter stem to help them withstand the high heat of the escaping exhaust gases. That gold color on the intakes is a coating to help strengthen the soft titanium they're made from. And here's a look at the intake manifold. This is a high rise Edelbrock intake with a large plenum to help maximize high RPM power. If you look into the manifold, you can see the plate that's been affixed to help keep air and fuel from getting into the unused runners. After this was shot, the gaps around the edges were sealed with silicone. High RPM engines require very stiff valve trains. For this engine, Dorton wants to use large half inch diameter push rods, which are incredibly stiff. But large diameter push rods like this just won't work with many high end roller lifters because the tie bars limit the push rod diameter, as you can see here. So the block has been bushed to accept keyed lifters. Notice the slots on the top of the lifter bushings. These got a keyed lifter that has no tie bar. The key, you can see them at the top of the lifters, is guided by the slot to keep the roller lifter from spinning in the bore. And now you have practically unlimited push rod clearance for these bad boys Dorton wants to run. These key lifters, by the way, are from Morel, and they have a DLC coating to make the outer surface extremely hard. And with a diameter of 937 thousandths of an inch, they're also significantly larger than the standard 842 lifter size. This allows the lifter's roller wheel to be quite a bit larger, reducing the strain on the valve train as a whole. Multi-layer steel gaskets were chosen to help seal the combustion chambers and have a 40 thousandths thickness when the heads are fully bolted down. To go with Crane Cam's large duration roller, Dorton is using a set of nested valve springs from PAC. They have 160 pounds of pressure on the seat and 600 open. By the way, total valve lift will be in the range of 800 thousandths of an inch for the intakes and 850 for the exhausts. The retainers are tool steel machined for minimum weight. You can see here where the valve springs have been left off for the rear cylinder. To keep oil from dripping into the combustion chamber, the valve guide has been tapped and then sealed with small pipe plugs. 
Bolting up a set of SB2 cylinder heads can be a bit of a pain. Because it's designed specifically for racing, it simply won't work with standard head bolts in some locations. You have to use studs. With the SB2, the ports were given priority, so you have to bolt the head through the intake ports in a couple locations and then add a plug later. And the plugs also aren't interchangeable because the underside has been ground to match the specific shape of the intake port it's in. By the way, here you can see the stud extending slightly from the floor of the port. Now this really isn't an impediment to power because at high RPM levels with an SB2, all the flow is across the roof of the port. Another quirk is some of the outer studs are directly below the exhaust flange and a crow's foot is required on your torque wrench to get it tight. This is an engine that definitely requires patience to build. We've already mentioned that Dorton will be using ultra stiff half inch diameter push rods to limit flex. He ended up using 8 inch 825,000 intakes and 8 inch 875 push rods for exhausts. Because the valve stems are so narrow to reduce overall valve train mass, lash caps have to be added to each valve stem to provide just a little bit more diameter for the rocker arms roller tip to glide across. Typically, the full race SB2 rocker arms used by NASCAR Cup teams back in the day were non-adjustable and you had to use shims to set the valve lash. This is a super finicky process and very time consuming, which probably would have caused problems at Bonneville where you're always in a time crunch. So Dorton worked with TND for this set of aluminum rocker arms with adjusters on the push rod side of the rockers. The aluminum TNDs are super stable with minimal mass, so they won't hurt the high RPM performance of the engine. Rocker arm ratio is 1.8 to 1 for the intakes and 1.95 to 1 for the exhaust. And as we mentioned earlier, total lift is in the range of 800 thousandths of an inch for the intake valves and 850 for the exhaust. Cold lash is set at eight and 10 thousandths for the intakes and exhausts. When the engine is hot, both will grow by about 10 thousandths of an inch. The SB2 architecture uses a separate valley cover and intake manifold to totally separate the hot coolant from the air and fuel charge flowing through the intake. And again, you can see the plate blocking off the rear two ports inside the intake. And here's another trick feature the NASCAR guys came up with that Dorton likes to take advantage of. This is a six stage auto verde dry sump oil pump that pulls oil from both the dry sump pan and the lifter valley to practically eliminate any power robbing windage. The oil pan is cut from one chunk of aluminum billet and it seals against the main caps to create chambers underneath each crankshaft throw. There's a pickup underneath each, so oil is practically sucked out of the engine as quickly as possible. The distributor is used only to route the spark to the proper plug. Up front, an MSD crank trigger is mounted to the ATI damper shell to control ignition timing. You may have noticed a different black carburetor earlier in the video. At this point, Dorton has already done some testing and determined that the 260 cubic inch V6 works best with an 1150 CFM Holley Dominator carburetor. Yeah, you heard that right. A V6 with a Dominator carb bolted on top. That's because land speed racing is all about maximum airflow. We don't even care how the engine performs at less than 6,000 RPM. This bad boy won't even get going until most engines have already exceeded their red line. The first time this engine was built, Dorton modified a distributor to fire at just six points instead of the usual eight, but the race team could never get the system to work properly with their setup in the race car. So this season, he's allowing the ignition system to think it's still working on a V8. For testing, we've simply grounded the back two plugs and wires against the dyno. And it's pretty cool to see them fire. But an uncontained spark in a race car isn't exactly a good idea. So he's also fabricated this aluminum vessel, which will hold the spark plugs and not allow any gases to reach the spark. So let's burn some race gas.
again, nobody's really going to need to convert a perfectly good V8 into an ultra high RPM V6 unless you're trying to find some kind of advantage in racing. But if you love engines and horsepower, you can definitely appreciate the ingenuity here. dyno pull didn't even start until 6,000 rpm and when we pulled the handle at 9,200 rpm we still hadn't reached peak power. Still with peak torque of 393.3 pound-feet at 7,300 rpm and 663.3 horsepower at 9,200 rpm this engine is quite the little beast. Incredibly that's over two and a half horsepower per cubic inch on a naturally aspirated engine and we were dynoing on a 97 degree day here in the south. Dorton's calculation says that the Hot Rod Hoodlums race team should have more than enough horsepower to absolutely smash the current record of 228.7 miles per hour at Bonneville. It'll make more power, but 9200 RPM is simply the red line Dorton assigned to the engine to ensure its health during those massively hard, five mile long, wide open throttle blasts across the salt. Hey, thanks for watching. I'll try to update the results after Bonneville to let you know how this engine did. And if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and consider subscribing for more great engine build videos in the future. Thanks again.